I'm going to say hello to Joseph, Jack, Aileen, and Susan again. Hi, guys. Uh, and uh, let's get started. Uh, so one of the things we talked about last time was the, the challenge of dating the Exodus. And I think this, this challenge of dating the Exodus, uh, it has implications for what assumptions we make about the rest of Israelite history, uh, you know, in particular about the period of the judges. And uh, it's, obvi it's very obvious and a very simple problem. Uh, but basically, if we go with the late Exodus that we were going with last time, if we go with the 13th century BC Exodus, then the period of the judges becomes shorter. And uh, because we kind of know when, when Saul and David and Solomon happened, roughly between 1040 and 935 BC is where we can put Saul, uh, Saul David, and Solomon. Uh, so if we know when the kingdom happened, Thanks. Uh, if we know when the kingdom happened, then what we have to do is try to figure out where to put the exodus, and then we can figure out how long the period of the judges lasts. And it's not really a big problem. It doesn't really matter for salvation history. The only thing that matters is whether the judges overlapped with each other or not. And basically, if we go with a long period of the judges, then we can make the judges go end to end. And if we go with a short period of the judges, then we can assume that they overlapped. Okay, so as far as biblical chronology goes, there are some implications for that question of, of dating uh, the exodus. Now, the, the late exodus Exodus is attractive for a variety of reasons. The, uh, the 13th century BC Exodus is, is attractive for, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, and it's not just because of Egyptian politics. Remember, we mentioned last time that uh, Egypt had entered a state of weakness and decline by the 13th century BC, we, a weakness and decline that you do not see in Egyptian history in the 15th century BC. So having, having an early exodus, is, it's difficult to imagine the Israelites escaping from the Egyptians and coming to, a, to the Promised Land at a time when Egypt actually ruled the Promised Land. Right? That doesn't really work. So if we go with the 13th century BC exodus, you're talking about a period of weakness and decline here in Egypt. But you're also talking about a time when the other great empire in the Fertile Crescent was preoccupied with other matters and wouldn't necessarily have noticed the entry of the Israelites into the land of Canaan. So what's the other great empire of the Fertile Crescent in the 13th century BC? It would be not the third dynasty of Ur, right? It would be, well, of course, the Hittite empire is relevant. Of course, the, the real heartland of the Hittites was up here in Asia Minor. Um, but the, the other great empire in the Fertile Crescent in this period would be the original Assyrian Empire. Okay, so the original Assyrian Empire was actually in a, in a period here in the 13th century BC where they were preoccupied principally with their, with their Hittite wars, as a matter of fact. They were attempting to conquer uh, northern Syria and Cilicia, this region around here where, you know, Tarsus, where, you know, St. Paul and all of that. Uh, this, this whole region up here uh, was, it was the scene of these great wars between the Hittite and Assyrian empires. And so you have this time when, when Assyria is preoccupied with wars, wars not only on that flank, but also on, on their other flank down here against the, the rising Babylonians who always were trying to throw off the Assyrian yoke, while at the same time Egypt is too weak and too preoccupied with events here uh, to, to really uh, extend their power or project their power into the land of Canaan. And so the 13th century BC, it, it becomes a, a very attractive time to date the Exodus. Now, obviously the Exodus concludes in dramatic fashion with the great story of Joshua, the Israelite champion. It's a story that's well known to you, Joshua leading the Israelites across the Jordan River, circumcising them, uh, having the priests carry the, the Holy Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan to stop the flow of the river while the 12 tribes of Israel walked across and picked up stones, set up the stones at Gilgal to symbolize the covenant and the entry into the Promised Land. And then, of course, the great sack of Jericho and the, and the famous harem, or destruction of Jericho by the Israelites. It's a story that's very familiar to us, and, and the, this whole martial um, epic in the Bible, which you can really see Joshua and Judges as being kind of like, it, it's almost like the Israelite version of, of the Iliad or something like that. It, it, it's this, this story of wars, the clashing of arms, bloodshed, violence, the annihilation of nations and of peoples and of cities. Uh, there, there really is no euphemism uh, or, or, you know, polite veil that's drawn across the violence in the books of Joshua and in the Judges. Uh, but ultimately, I think what, what the books of Joshua and Judges are really all about, it's not so much about the war and about the violence. Ultimately, we can see the books of Joshua and Judges as being about the liturgy and about worship. The same is true for the Pentateuch, and the same is true for the other historical books, the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. When you look at Israelite history, you're talking about the history of liturgy, the history of ritual, and the history of the worship of God. And this is a very, very important point to make, okay, because I think oftentimes we kind of assume that Old Testament religion is the religion of the word or the religion of the book. We sort of imagine Old Testament, Old Testament religion vaguely being about 
um, you know, sort of legal preoccupations, don't eat this, don't eat that, and, and read the book, and that's about it. But you get a very, very different picture from the Old Testament. You get a picture of, of a religion that's all about liturgy. It's all about ritual. Liturgy is the key. Ritual is the hermeneutic key to understand salvation history in the Old Testament, and we always have to keep that in mind. Okay. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about the mission of the Israelites, though, as they come into the Promised Land. Keep in mind the historical setting, keep in mind the historical situation. You, you have a situation here where uh, this one wing of the Fertile Crescent here in Mesopotamia has effectively been divorced from the other wing of the Fertile Crescent here in Egypt by the preoccupations and weaknesses of the great empires. Okay, so that's the context for the entry into the Promised Land and the conquest of the Promised Land. It's at a time when neither empire is capable, uh, or not necessarily capable, neither empire is particularly interested in this period in preoccupying themselves in the Promised Land. And it helps explain the entry into the Promised Land. It helps explain the conquest and division of the land. Because oftentimes people wonder, well, you know, yeah, obviously in the Bible you hear about Hittites and Gergesites and Jebusites and Canaanites and all these other Zites that you see. Um, but, you know, the, the, really, I mean, politically, what's going on there. You just have a bunch of wandering tribes and they're like, oh crap, here come the Israelites. No, it, it's, it, it's a situation where the great empires of that region found themselves unable to intervene as the Israelites entered in and um, basically <laughs> inflicted themselves uh, upon these poor idolaters. So what happens then uh, in the conquest? What, what's their mission? What's their task? And do they succeed? Well, first of all, the, the mission and task of the Israelites in entering the Promised Land is obviously to conquer it and to eliminate the people who dwell there. And there's absolutely no doubt about that. That point is made very, very clear over and over again in the books of Joshua and Judges. They're to complete the conquest. They're to drive the peoples out of the land. They're to do away with these peoples completely. They're not to allow them to remain in the land. And the more we understand about Semitic, the Semitic paganism of the Canaanites, the more it makes sense. Right? The, the message clearly in Joshua and Judges was that there's basically nothing that the Israelites can do with these people. You can't evangelize them, because of, well, why can't the Israelites evangelize them? Well, because the Israelites themselves are far too weak, far too prone to idolatry, far too prone to adopt the manners and mores of the people that surround them, right? The Israelites, they, they prove themselves to be incapable of functioning as a missionary people in Joshua and Judges. So they're told to enter the land and to conquer it. And do they enter it? Do they conquer it? Not the way they're supposed to, right? Not the way they're supposed to. First of all, in Joshua's lifetime, he divides the land into 12 portions. Now, you might think to yourself, well, why 12 portions? Obviously, it's for the 12 tribes of Israel, right? But people tend to get a little bit confused because, of course, there are 12 tribes of Israel, very famously. Uh, but <laughs> there's two ways of counting the 12 tribes of Israel. On the one hand, Jacob had 12 sons, and each son became the father of a tribe, right? On the other hand, the tribe of Levi doesn't receive any land. When the land is divided and the conquest has commenced, the tribe of Levi is not assigned a portion of land. The, the burnt offerings to the Lord are their portion. Right. Why are they not assigned a portion of land? Well, for obvious reasons. Right? The Levites' function is a ritual function. It's a liturgical function. Remember, liturgy and ritual is going to be kind of the point of this whole thing, bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, establishing a covenant with the Israelites, and giving them a land. The whole teleology of that is about the liturgy. So the Levites, are, and, and, and within the Levite tribe, the Levitical priests are the ones who carry out the liturgy. They're charged with the liturgy. But those who are charged with ritual functions cannot come in contact with blood. To be assigned a chunk of land is to be assigned a chunk of land to conquer, right? And conquest is not, that's just not on the table for the Levites in this period. They can't go in and do the harem and do the extermination of these Canaanites because it would render them incapable of performing their ritual function, right? So how do you still have 12 tribes of Israel then? Well... Yeah, there we go. Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph. Okay, so, so Joseph had two sons, so you can count it that way, and then you, you still have 12 tribes of Israel. So the land is divided into 12 chunks uh, because Ephraim and Manasseh each get a chunk of their own. All right. But the tribe of Levi is not given a chunk. The tribe of Levi is a special tribe. They're set apart. Uh, their function is, is liturgical and, and ritual. Okay, so... As you read the book of Judges, if you ever sit down and read the book of Judges, I'd recommend it. It's a lot of fun. It's great reading. Um, but there, you notice there's a cyclical quality to the book. You guys are shaking your heads. It's, no, there, there, there's a real cyclical quality to the narrative in the, in the book of the Judges. Right? After the death of Joshua, right, Israel finds itself um, in a situation where there's a failure to complete the conquest. And the failure to complete the conquest as assigned by God, that's what sets the stage for the whole narrative of Judges. 
if you have your Bible and you turn to Judges chapter 1, uh, there's a litany of what the tribes failed to do. Okay, what happens? Uh, I mean, it, it, it's really, really uh, kind of a tragic thing. What happens? The, the house of Joseph went up against Bethel, and the Lord went with them. The house of Joseph sent to spy out Bethel. They saw a man coming out of the city. They said, show us the way into your city, and we'll deal kindly with you. He showed them the way into the city. <laughs> they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites and built a city and called its name Luz. That is its name to this day. But what happens next? Manasseh, that's part of the house of Joseph, they did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheon, or its villages, right? And when Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalol, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and they became subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or of Sidon or Achlab or Achzib or Helba or Afik or of Rehob. And the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. And what happens? The Amorites pressed the Danites back into the hill country. The Amorites persisted in dwelling in Har Harez, in Aijalon, and in Sha'albim, but the hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily upon them, and they became subject to forced labor. So what's going on? The Israelites are disobeying God's command. It's a lot more convenient to use the Canaanites for forced labor than it is to drive them out. All right, and so you use them for forced labor, you use them as slaves, you live among them, and then Canaanite religion becomes, in practice, the religion of the Israelites. Right. And the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were round about them, and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. All right. Serving the Baals, this is not benign paganism. This is not intellectual paganism. Uh, th this is not the paganism of the Areopagus, the, of, of St. Paul. All right. th this, is, this is paganism that involves all the horrors of human sacrifice, and temple prostitution of both male and female varieties. Uh, Canaanite paganism was a horrifying, horrifying thing, right? And yet the Israelites found it irresistibly attractive. So the Israelites in the land, they fall into the paganism of those around about them. And what happens? You have a cycle in the book of Judges where the Lord raises up oppressors and plunderers to oppress and plunder the Israelites. And when they're being oppressed and plundering, then they repent. And they beg God, please deliver us. And then a judge comes. And you have the cycle repeated again and again. Uh, a judge like Gideon, or a judge like Samson, or a judge like Deborah delivers the Israelites from their oppression. And then as soon as they're delivered from their oppression, the next generation of Israelites goes back to their old ways. Okay. So the narrative cycle of judges, it's one of doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord, being punished by oppressors, and then having been punished, repenting having a judge show up and deliver you. And not all the judges are really great guys. I mean, uh, you, you look at some of these judges and, and you, you have wild stories about the judges <laughs> involving sort of very, very, very dicey religious practices, including human sacrifice, uh, very bizarre things. I mean, even, even a guy like Samson is sort of a, uh, he's really hit or miss when it comes to morality, right? So the, the, the judges are not necessarily great guys, right? But they're men that the Lord uses as instruments to deliver Israel when Israel repents and returns to proper worship, right? So the book of the Judges, once again, it's about worship. Now, what's going on then uh, in this period? Uh, well, basically, as the period of the Judges winds to its conclusion, okay, what we're seeing is the rise of Assyria, the reorganization of the original Assyrian Empire. Uh, between the late 12th and the early 11th century uh, is when you have the reign of that great king of Assyria, Tiglath-Pileser uh, Tiglath I. Right? Now this is a time of tremendous expansion for the Assyrian Empire. You have co Assyrian conquests that extend all the way up through Cilicia into Asia Minor, all the way up here um, uh, towards the, uh, the Caucasus. You have Assyrian conquests that extend certainly throughout northern Syria and down towards the Persian Gulf. The, the Assyrians in this period basically create an empire that expands beyond the Fertile Crescent at the expense of Scythian and Hittite empires and, and other peoples who are around about them. Uh, this original Assyrian Empire, despite its antiquity, it was a tremendously sophisticated thing. In the time of Tiglath-Pileser I, in the time of Ashur bel Kalan and these other early Assyrian emperors, uh, you have not only very large cities and, and very sophisticated 
uh, societies with multiple levels of society and all kinds of commerce and things like that going on. Uh, but even your, your first zoological and botanical gardens and, and sort of you know, grand projects that one associates with, uh, with imperial municipalities, uh, you see those in this period. The, the records of the, the great botanical and zoological gardens from this early Assyrian period are amazing. Now, it, it's funny because in a much later period, in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, people talk about the, the hanging gardens of Babylon and all that, and, and people debate and say, oh, come on, it's totally, it's totally unrealistic that there could have been these vast hanging gardens in Babylon. But we know hundreds and hundreds of years earlier than that, in ancient Assyria, they had hanging gardens that, that would blow your mind, right? And, and zoos that collected animals from the four corners of the earth for, for the entertainment of the royal classes, for the entertainment of the emperors and, and their courtiers, right? Uh, so Assyria becomes a formidable empire again in this period in the time of the judges. And then perhaps, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting how divine providence works. Perhaps it makes sense that it's in this period in the 11th century BC that Israel is transformed into a kingdom. Because in the time of the judges, the tribes don't really cooperate well with one another. And it's easy to imagine that Israel could have been swallowed up by this resurgent, expansionistic program of the Assyrians in the time of Tiglath-Pileser and, and his successors throughout the 11th century. It's easy to imagine the tribes of Israel just disappearing into this you know, maelstrom of, of everything that was going on in the time of a rising Assyrian empire. But it's in this period that the Israelites come and they come in the, and they send representatives to talk to Samuel, the last of the judges, and they say, we want a king because we want to be like the nations round about us. Now, God makes it clear that that wasn't his plan originally. God would have preferred that the Israelites had looked to proper worship and living moral lives, and he would have, he would have taken care of them. I, I think there's a lesson here. If, if you live the right way and trust in divine providence in a radical way, things kind of work out for you. But the Israelites couldn't bring themselves to do that. They're constantly backsliding into their paganism. And so they, they have to take matters into their own hands. They have to demand a king to organize the tribes, to defend them. And they're warned by Samuel. Right? If we transform from a tribal confederation here on the edges of empires, right? on the edges of these two great empires, if we transform from a tribal confederation into a state that's ruled by a king, into a monarchy, the life of the average Israelite is going to change dramatically. Right? Your freedom is going to go away to a great extent. Your sons are going to be drafted into service. Your daughters are going to be drafted into other kinds of service. Your goods are going to be taxed. Everything's going to change if we become a kingdom like the people around about us. And the people say, this is what we want. All right? And to some extent, God is not entirely pleased with this because this is the easier route for the Israelites to select a king in order to survive in the Fertile Crescent in this period. It's easier for them than it would be to reform their lives and, and trust in God. Right. That's, that's what they can't do. Right. And so they say, fine, we don't care if our sons are drafted. We don't care if we're taxed. We don't care if the kings oppress us. But we want a king uh, to lead the armies of Israel into battle. All right. Now, the, the rise of Samuel, I think, as a judge, and, and in essence, Samuel's lifetime as a judge, it, it spans the reigns not only of the first king of Israel, Saul, but also the, the initial part of David's reign as king of Israel. And uh, the, the rise of Samuel, I think it's, it's a very, very interesting story because it helps us understand the importance of proper ritual. Everybody, you're familiar with the story that we, that's read at mass uh, frequently in, in the liturgy. I think we're, we're actually getting into the time of the liturgical year where we're going to hear this reading uh, if you go to the Novus Ordo. But it, it's the reading where Samuel is called. He gets his vocation. Right? And the story is, of course, that Samuel was the son of Hannah. The, the miraculously conceived son of Hannah who had been barren. And so Samuel was dedicated to the Lord. So he was living in the sanctuary at Shiloh, right, with Eli the priest and Eli's two sons who were also Levitical priests, Hophni and Phinehas, right? You guys familiar with Hophni and Phinehas? Hophni and Phinehas, it, it, it would be funny if it wasn't so sacrilegious. Uh, <laughs> Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Why? Not because they committed sexual sin, you know, everybody did that. Uh, not, not because they did this or that. Not because they, you know, even oppressed people or whatever. It was far, far worse. It was sacrilege. Sacrilege, the worst sin that you could ever commit in ancient Israel, right? And what kind of sacrilege did they commit? Well, as priests, they basically took advantage of the sacrificial offerings that people brought to the sanctuary at Shiloh to offer before the ark. They would grab the best pieces of the offerings and chow down on them. 
because it tasted good. And they took the portions reserved for the Lord, and the, you know, they sacrilegiously uh, you know, would have tailgate parties with these offerings. And uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's blasphemous, it's sacrilegious, and as a result, the house of Eli was destroyed, and Samuel was called, Samuel was raised up to be prophet and priest, right, as a sort of an adopted Levite, to be prophet and priest in place of Hophni and Phinehas. Now, of course, the center of, of Israelite worship is the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, with that, which was placed there at Shiloh. And the story of Hophni and Phinehas, it, it's, oh gosh, what they do with the Ark of the Covenant, it, it's so ridiculous. They, uh, they decide when they're going into battle against the Philistines to bring the Ark with them. All right, as a kind of a talisman, as a good luck charm. We bring the Ark with us, God will let us win. So they bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle, and of course, they're, they're routed by the Philistines, the Ark of the Covenant is captured, and Hophni and Phinehas are killed. All right. Now, <laughs> the Ark is taken to the Philistines, and the Philistines then go through this hilarious progression of moving the Ark from town to town to town, because every town they move it to, there's a plague, and half the people die, and, you know, or the, the god in the temple falls down and gets all broken, <laughs> or something like that. And uh, so they move the Ark from town to town, then finally they, they figure, we have to get rid of this Ark, but nobody's willing to go near it, so <laughs> they, no one's willing to carry it to the Israelites, so they put it on the back of a cart uh, with cows that, that haven't been milked, and they, and, and they hitch it up to those cows, and they, and they drive the cows to pull the cart. And the cows haven't been milked, their calves are taken away. So, the, so they're giving out this warning, mooing at the top of their lungs, going down the road, pulling the Ark of the Covenant back to the land of Israel. And when the Ark comes back to the land of Israel at Beth Shemesh, what happens? They take the Ark, people look into the Ark and gaze at it curiously, and God strikes them dead and makes a slaughter among the people. All right. So sacrilege versus proper worship, it, it's the theme of that whole passage uh, in, in Israelite history. Now, what happens though is Samuel as prophet, as judge, as priest, he finds himself basically getting fired by the Israelites. They want to transition to a kingdom, they want to transition to a king. And of course, God selects Saul. Now, the, the story of Saul, uh, you, you should go read it, I'd recommend going and reading it. it, it it's in the first book of Samuel. Fascinating, tragic story. Uh, the story of Saul, the way it's presented in the Bible, is with, with tremendous sensitivity uh, to the human elements that are involved in the story of Saul. You know, Saul was a guy, he, he was selected by Samuel, inspired by God, uh, to be the king. He was anointed by Samuel. Saul was blessed with the gift of prophecy. He was, he was blessed with the gift of, divi of divine inspiration. Uh, and God says to Saul, I would have established your throne forever, except for your sins. And what is Saul's sin? Saul's sin is sacrilege once again, sacrilegiously making an illicit offering before battle. That's what dooms Saul and leads to God's promise to take the throne away from Saul. So what's going on then in Saul's reign? He has this kind of lengthy reign. He reigns for about 30 years, uh, and he's unable to complete the conquest. He's unable to complete the conquest of the Promised Land because God is not with him because of his sacrilege. That's the way it's explained in the scriptural text, right? What's going on, though, is that you have Canaanite tribes organizing and recombining with one another and holding on to different chunks of the Promised Land. Finally, of course, Saul dies in tragic fashion by his own hand, and his sons die, and the kingdom is taken from him, and David, the anointed son of Judah, is then able to become king. And his, his sort of inaugural act as king is the conquest of Jerusalem. Right? But if you look at the narrative logic of the early part of David's reign, right, once again, David would have a decently long reign. He reigns for about 40 years as king of Israel. And, uh, but the, the inaugural act of his reign, that's what wins David divine favor. That's what wins David the promise of an eternal throne. Okay, Because what does David do? What, what, what's the one thing that wins God's favor? I mean, David sinned. David was a man who was flawed. Da David sinned in sometimes spectacular ways. I mean, you've got to love the story of Bathsheba, right? He's <laughs> that, that story begins it, it, with, with the scripture telling us that it was this the time of the year when kings go forth to war. And David was at home laying around on his couch. So he wasn't going forth to war. That's where it starts. It starts with the occasion of sin, which is laziness, sloth. He's lounging around on his couch, and he's strolling around on his roof, scoping out the neighboring houses and people in them, or in this case, on them, uh, because of course Bathsheba was bathing outdoors, which why would you do that? Who knows? Uh, anyway, the <laughs> so David, it's not like David didn't sin, right? Well, we all know the stories of David's sin, of adultery and murder and all these different things. But why, despite his sins, is David given the promise of an eternal throne? It's because, once again, of liturgy, ritual, and proper worship. Right. What does David do? There, there's a lengthy story about this, which is it's actually contained in two places. It's contained in 1 Samuel, and it's also contained in 
in the Chronicles. All right. So you find it in Samuel, you find it in Chronicles. It's the story of David bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Right? And he doesn't just bring the Ark to Jerusalem. He tries to bring the Ark to Jerusalem once and fails because of the lack of proper worship, the lack of proper <laughs> liturgy. This is when they put the, the Ark up on a cart and the, the oxen stumble and you know, that poor guy Uzzah reaches his hand up to protect the Ark of the Covenant from falling and God strikes him dead for touching the Ark. And you think, well, what's the, what's the matter with the poor guy? He's just trying to save the ark, right? But what were they doing? They were treating the ark in a sacrilegious and disrespectful way, right? So then David panics because he doesn't know what's wrong. So they leave the ark there in the house of Obed-Edom, who is actually listed in the genealogies of Levites. So the ark was left in the house of a Levite, and that Levite's family was blessed with all kinds of material blessings. And David's starting to scratch his head. He's starting to figure it out, right? That sacred things and holy things bring life to those who treat them the right way, and they bring death to those who treat them the wrong way, those who handle them unworthily, as, or as even as St. Paul says about the Eucharist, if you don't discern the body of the Lord, this is why many of you have become sick and die, St. Paul says, right? So if you treat holy things without respect, they're deadly. Okay, David figures that out about the ark. So the next time he brings the ark to Jerusalem, they have this magnificent ritual of sacrifices every few steps of the way, and the priests carrying the ark on the poles, as the law of God in Deuteronomy specifies. Right? They bring the ark to Jerusalem, and the worship of the Israelites was centralized there. All Levitical worship, all priestly sacrifice was carried out in Jerusalem from the time of David onward, right, where the ark was kept. Now, um, a couple different points about that. What was ritual? What was worship? Right? Uh, ritual worship, as described in, in the books of Chronicles, it's basically um, a kind of perpetual adoration. David established a permanent college of priests in rotating shifts to sing psalms and pray before the Lord on a constant basis, very, very much like perpetual adoration before the presence of the Lord in the ark. You see, Israelite worship, it has far more in common with Christian worship of the traditional liturgical variety than, than you would ever guess or ever expect. Right? Oftentimes we have this mistaken assumption that there was no liturgy or that, that it was simply a, a religion of the word or something like that. Or that you could have a relationship with God at all without liturgy and without ritual. And that's never the case. And it certainly wasn't the case in the Old Testament. Okay, so uh, da th this is David's accomplishment then. Right? It brings God's blessing upon him. He's able to complete the conquest of the land in, in a far more perfect way than Saul or the judges had ever done. Uh, his house is blessed. He's promised an eternal throne. Of course, the reign of his son Solomon is rather different. Right? Solomon's reign is interesting because it's in the reign of Solomon, which we could say is between, well, roughly 975 to 935 BC here. It's in the reign of Solomon that the kingdom of Israel actually matters in the politics of the time. Okay. This is a time when uh, there's, there's tremendous weakness in Assyria. Assyria in the 10th century, uh, it, unlike the time of Tiglath-Pileser I, Assyria was, was ripped apart by civil wars, brutal civil wars, torn apart the Assyrian Empire. Right? And so Israel is able to sort of step into the power vacuum left behind by the disorganized and, and you know, sort of um, internally uh, just conflicted Assyrian Empire. This is an Assyrian Empire that's, that's no longer able to carry out the kind of global diplomacy that they had been carrying out before. And into that vacuum steps Solomon. Solomon was the great diplomat. This is why Solomon had 700 wives. 700 wives, that's 700 diplomatic treaties. Right there, right? 300 concubines, that's just for fun. But the 700 wives, that, that's, that's diplomacy. Okay, so what does Solomon do, right? He conducts diplomacy on a grand scale on a global scale, okay? And, and we see this, what, what this brings to Israel is a kind of a grand flourishing. Famous chapter in the Old Testament is uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, or if you have a Dewey Reims, it's 3 Kings chapter 10. Um, but fantastic, fantastic uh, passage here describing the splendor of the reign of Solomon. And the Israelites, despite Solomon's flaws, despite his sins, they always preserve this memory of the splendor of the reign of Solomon. I think it's irresistible for a people to preserve a memory of a time when you mattered politically, right? And there's this fantastic passage here. Uh, the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, right? She came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with camels bearing spices, gold and precious stones. She comes to Solomon and told him all that was on her mind, and he answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king which he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, and their clothing, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings which he offered in the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her, no more spirit. Haruk, the spirit, the breath, was gone. 
Right? And she said, the report was true, which I had heard in my own land of your affairs and of your wisdom, and I did not believe the reports until I came, and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report which I had heard. Right? It's amazing. And you're told about the abundance of gold and precious spices, that the fleet of Hiram, who is the king of Tyre, right here, sort of a vassal of Solomon, uh, this, this Canaanite king of, of uh, Tyre, brought gold from Ophir and almond wood and precious stones. Uh, and the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold, besides that which came from the traders and the traffic of the merchants, from all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the land. And Solomon made 200 large, shekels, uh, large shields of beaten gold, with 600 shekels of gold in each shield, 300 shields of beaten gold, with three minas of gold in each shield, and he put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. He made an, an ivory throne overlaid it with the finest gold, but in the midst of Solomon's wealth and the splendor and the flourishing of Solomon's reign, you see what's going wrong here. You're going to see, what does he accumulate? He's accumulating silver and gold, right? And we're told that he imported horses from Egypt and chariots, and he loved many foreign women, the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. So what is Solomon doing? Right? The text is very sensitive to this. Right? The text is sensitive to both aspects of it. On the one hand, this is splendid. This is absolutely the, the height of Israelite prosperity, the height of Israelite splendor. Right? And yet, on the other hand, the seeds of destruction are found in the immorality of the king. He's accumulating silver and gold, horses and chariots from Egypt, and wives, foreign women. And I love it. If you just flip to, <laughs> flip to Deuteronomy chapter 17, <laughs> there are three things that the king is not supposed to accumulate. This is fantastic. Deuteronomy 17, 14. When you come into the land which the Lord your God gives you and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are round about me, you may indeed set as king over you him whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you, who is not your brother. Only, you see, there's this one caveat. Only, number one, he must not multiply horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Okay. And he shall not multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply for himself silver and gold. Whoops. All the things that Solomon did, all the things that all ancient Near Eastern kings did. Right. So you see in the reign of Solomon, the seeds of destruction are planted here in the king's departure from the law and in the way in which he behaves uh, you know, like a standard local king of that region. And of course, why is it a problem? Right? Why are any of these things a problem? Remember, the theme of the text is ritual. The theme of the text is worship. These things are a problem because they lead Solomon to false worship. And he allows Canaanite worship and the building of high places the building of Canaanite shrines for human sacrifice and temple prostitution. He allows these things in order to please his foreign wives. Right? And so God promises him that the kingdom will be taken away, not in his lifetime, but in the lifetime of his son. Okay. So what's being provided there in 1 Kings? What's being provided there is it's a rationale for what happens after the death of Solomon in 935. After Solomon's death in 935, that splendid Israelite kingdom that we were talking about, that wealthy kingdom engaging not only in diplomacy on a grand scale throughout the Fertile Crescent, the Mediterranean, and even down the Red Sea, uh, I mean, the, the, sh the ships uh, it, from Solomon's kingdom, they traded as far away as Madagascar and India. They traded as far away as, as the Western Mediterranean, right? So it's all all kinds of exotic luxury goods were brought into Solomon's kingdom in his reign. That splendid kingdom, right, is torn apart after Solomon's death by the rebellion of the northern tribes, right? And that division of the kingdom in the first year of the reign of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, it's, re it's, it's the event that sows the seeds for Israel's ultimate destruction as a political entity, all right? First of all, what happens? You have a rebellion of the ten tribes of the north led by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And what does Jeroboam do? He realizes, once again, it's all about ritual. Jeroboam knows it's all about ritual. And he knows that if the people have to return to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then they'll return in their, to their submission uh, to the house of David. They'll return to submit to the house of David and to Judah. And so he says, no, we have to create other shrines in the north for the ten tribes. And so he builds high places, and he places golden calves in those shrines in the high places. Right? And this gives rise to that, that famous sort of hybrid religion of the northern regions of Israel that we today know as Samaritan. the Samaritan religion, right? And it was called the Samaritan religion in the time of our Lord. It dates back to this time of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and his establishment of alternative religious shrines, 
with golden calves, and a false priesthood with priests who are not from among the Levites, right? So this is, this is blasphemy, this is idolatry, this is everything that's guaranteed to doom your kingdom, right? So this period of the, of the divided kingdom, it lasts from 935 to 722. And what's going on kind of in the, in the wider world in that period between 935 and 722? Unfortunately for the northern kingdom, Assyria has gotten its act together in the meantime. A power was rising in this period leading into the 8th century that the Israelites would not be able to resist, that the kingdom of the north would not be able to resist. This is the period in which the foundation was laid for the Assyrian conquest of the Fertile Crescent. Okay. And it took place in stages. It took place with, with the, the Assyrian Empire, or, or what we call the Neo-Assyrian Empire, because it's really the second Assyrian Empire, uh, conquering virtually the entire Fertile Crescent, uh, including Egypt, actually, in this period, and subduing famously in the year 722 BC the ten tribes of the north, who become the lost tribes. Right? Now, this was an event that was, it was preceded, of course, by God sending prophet after prophet after prophet, both to the northern and to the southern kingdom. Right? You have some prophets whose special mission is to evangelize the, the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, other prophets whose special mission is to evangelize the north. Of course, the, the most famous prophet to the northern kingdom was Elijah, the major prophet. Most famous minor prophet in the northern kingdom was our, our favorite, got eaten by a whale. Jonah, right? <laughs> Jonah, the son of Amittai, who was a prophet in the time of Jeroboam II, right? And it, it's this fantastic story, right? Because, he, you know, he's mentioned in the historical books. Jonah was a historical figure. He was a prophet of the northern kingdom in the time of Jeroboam II, and the Lord sends him to go to Nineveh. It's so ironic, right? The irony that's there, it would have been obvious to any Israelite reader of the book of Jonah. He's being sent to the capital city of his enemies, right? It would be like sending a Yankees fan like me to evangelize Fenway Park. You know, I, I just, Lord, just destroy that place. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what he wants. He doesn't want the Lord to have mercy on Nineveh. He doesn't want the Lord to save Nineveh, right? And, and this is why Jonah resists that mission. Of course, the Lord sends him anyway and spares Nineveh at the time, but only for a time, right? Only for a time. The destruction of Nineveh would eventually come. Um, great prophet who foretold the destruction of Nineveh was the prophet Nahum. Okay, and if you're looking for Nahum, it's right before Habakkuk uh, in your Bible. So it's, it's you know, back there with all, all the minor prophets. Um, but the, but the, story of the, prophet, uh, the story told by uh, the, uh, the prophet Nahum here, it's an oracle, right? An oracle concerning Nineveh. It's fantastic. Uh, he starts out by saying, The Lord is a jealous God and avenging. He's avenging and wrathful. He takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. He's slow to anger and of great might, and he will by no means clear the guilty. Then you have this fantastic oracle against Nineveh. The shatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts, watch the road, gird your loins, collect your strength, for the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. Plunderers have stripped them and ruined their branches. The shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. His chariots flash like flame when mustered in array. The chargers prance, the chariots rage in the streets. They rush back and forth through the squares. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and booty, no end to the plunder, the crack of whip, rumble of wheel, galloping horse, bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword, glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end, they stumble over the bodies, and for all the countless harlotries of the harlot, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her harlotries and peoples with her charms, behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will let nations look on your nakedness and kingdoms on your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you an object of scorn. And all those who look on you will shrink from you and say, Wasted is Nineveh. Who will moan over her? From where shall I seek comforters for her? So, they don't mince words, right? Now, who, uh, of course, the, the, the crack of whip and rumble of wheel and the glittering spears and all that, uh, who's... who's Whose chariots and spears are those that are coming to destroy Nineveh? Well, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire, right? So it's Babylon, right? It, it, it's the chariots and spears of the Babylonians. Uh, that, that story of, of the fall of the Assyrian Empire, it, it's, it's really a fascinating thing because it happens so suddenly. I mean, I guess you could, you could detect rumblings of the, the weakening of the Assyrian Empire in the middle of the 7th century in the time of Josiah, king of Judah. When Josiah was the king of Judah between 641 and 609, he was basically a vassal of the Assyrian Empire. Remember, the, the Assyrians had conquered the, the whole 
Fertile Crescent, right? So he's basically a vassal of the Assyrians, and yet he's able to introduce religious reforms that are, that are chronicled uh, in, in Second Kings in, in great detail, right? So you can see there that there's a certain modicum of independence enjoyed by the kingdom of Judah there. Maybe that's a sign of the Assyrian Empire's weakness. But certainly, after the death of the, of the great Ashurbanipal in 627 BC, certainly at that point, brutal civil war breaks out. And you have the rise of this previously really obscure king of Babylon uh, named Nabopolassar, right? And he allied himself with the Medes and Scythians and uh, created a, a coalition of peoples who basically, they all teamed up and they all agreed to show up at Nineveh on the same day. You know, it was like a flash mob, like social networking. Hey, let's all go. <laughs> you know? And uh, so they, they all show up in 612 at, at, at the city of Nineveh and they completely destroy it. They, and, and Nineveh was a great city, right? The Old Testament, especially in the book of Jonah, waxes eloquent about the size and majesty and splendor of the city of Nineveh. Uh, it, it was destroyed. Not one stone was left upon it. Well, that's a little bit. One, maybe there was one stone left upon another, right? But, but it was destroyed, and it was never rebuilt by the Babylonians. Okay. So what are we seeing then politically here in the 7th century BC? We're seeing the rise of what we could call the Neo-Babylonian Empire, right? Why do we say Neo-Babylonian? Well, just like with Neo-Assyrian Empire, we're distinguishing it from its more ancient counterpart, and we would call this the Neo-Babylonian Empire to distinguish it from, from more ancient Akkadian uh, or Sumerian empires, right? So the Neo-Babylonian Empire that, that arises in this period is ultimately going to be the empire that carries Israel off into captivity in the 6th century BC uh, and, and makes Judah a captive people and makes Judah's kings captive, right? Now, it's interesting, right, because the, the religious reforms of Josiah, the king of Judah, they really didn't come a moment too soon. It's really, really fascinating to take a look at those reforms. They're in 2 Kings chapter 22, and they give us a picture of just how far Judah had fallen from proper worship while under Assyrian domination, right? So Josiah says he's eight years old when he begins to reign. He reigns 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was, Je uh, was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. It's so rare that you read those words in the Old Testament. Everybody does what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Right? So he does what is right, in the, and you're like, that has to be a typo, right? Uh, but he walked in all the way of David, his father, and he did not turn aside from the right, to the right hand or to the left, right? Now, so what happens here? What happens? It's when he's 18 years old. King Josiah, right, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, to the temple. He says, go to Hilkiah the high priest so he can reckon the amount of money that's been brought into the temple, right, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. And let it, of course, what are they paying for when they go to the temple? Why is the temple collecting all this money? No. Prostitutes. Right? So he goes, go, go figure out how much money, you know, they're, they're bringing in. And uh, let it be given into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it, and, you know, that sort of thing. Repair the house, carpenters, builders, masons, buy timber, quarry stone, repair the house, uh, etc. So Hilkiah, sa when Shaphan the secretary shows up, Hilkiah says to him, hey, guess what? I found a book in a closet or behind a wall. Uh, I found a book, and it, it has the law in it. I think you should read it. <laughs> and he gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan came to the king and he goes, uh, so they emptied out the money that was found in the house and they gave it to the hand of the workman and Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. Here's the book. <laughs> and when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And he commanded Hilkiah the high priest, and Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Achor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah the king's servant. And he said, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for all the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book. What is this book? It's the Torah. He's never heard of it before. He doesn't know what it is. He's totally unacquainted with the, the prescriptions that are in this book. He's like, oh my gosh, our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. This isn't what we're doing, right? So Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam and Achbor and Shaphan and Asiah, they go to Hulda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe, right? Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they talked to her and she said, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, I will bring evil upon this place and its inhabitants. All the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Why does he say that? Why does she say that, I mean? The prophetess says, I will bring evil upon you all the words of the book. Why? Because every covenant has two parts. Every covenant has blessings and curses. And all the curses that are in the Torah for Israelites who break the law and break the covenant, the Lord is saying, okay, now you found the book, right? And you found it just in time because I'm going to let you know everything that's described here in the Torah that's going to happen to you for not obeying the law, all of that stuff is about to happen, right? 
and they wept, and they repented, right? And, and Josiah's reforms are far-reaching. Uh, he executed all the temple prostitutes. Uh, he executed all the pagan priests. Uh, he took all the idols <laughs> out of the temple. You know, we're not supposed to have those. He broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes, which were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the Asherah. Asherah are the totem pole things, right? This is bad. This is really, really bad. And you get the impression it's been this way for a while. They celebrate the Passover, and it says it was the first time that the Passover had been celebrated in Jerusalem, since the, or that had been celebrated in Israel at all, since the time of the judges. And he sent men to the high places erected by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, way back in the 10th century BC. 400-year-old high places that had been built by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. And he broke down those altars. Right? He, he sent messengers out, even into, you get the impression he's sending messengers out into parts of the Assyrian Empire that are no longer under the king's control. Right? And they're breaking down these pagan shrines and things like that. It's a far-reaching religious reform, and it happens just in time because this is when Israel is brought into captivity and effectively for the rest of Israel's life as a nation until the coming of Christ, Israel would be a captive. First of Babylon, all right, and then of the Persians, although allowed to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, right, still a captive, still a subject people, right, and then subject to the Hellenistic empires and subject to Rome. Right. And so in the time of, of uh, the Maccabees, right, in the Hellenistic period, in the second century BC, when you have a rebellion, what's the rebellion about? Right? It's not about politics. It's about ritual. It's about worship. It's about liturgy. That's what the Maccabees are all about. Right? And in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, when he goes into the temple and overturns the money-changing tables and, and cleanses the temple with his whip, it's about worship. It's about ritual. And everything that our Lord did was about creating a system uh, that was based upon true worship, right? the true worship of God, to worship God in spirit and in truth. So ultimately, the salvation history of Israel, which is our salvation history, right? it's a history of how true worship was allowed uh, to endure through God's providence, to endure and to survive and to be given to us as a gift. Right? through all the politics and the shifting empires of the ancient Fertile Crescent. And the, the history of Israel, it's deeply enmeshed in and embedded in the history of the Fertile Crescent, and yet there's always something different about Israel. And what was different about them was that God was paying attention, God had a vocation for them, and it was a vocation that they ran from, right? but it was a vocation that God could not allow to die. So, we're done for now. Thanks. You should be able to tell me Every single major figure and major event in the story of salvation history from Adam to Jesus Christ so that when the words of the Gospel of Matthew are proclaimed and that genealogy is given to us to tell us that great patrimony and that gift which has come down to us from the beginning, you know who those people are. You know their stories. You know what was taking place at their time to understand how God fought for us generation to generation he never gave up on us until that day when our lord was born here upon this earth right, for the salvation uh, a gentleman asked me about the ark of the covenant is it in jerusalem today and and the answer is no uh, the ark of the covenant of course was famously hidden on mount sinai at the time of the babylonian captivity uh it, it was hidden away and uh in at the time of the maccabees um you know it, it's interesting there, there's some maybe some sort of replica ark that's created at that point because uh, when Titus and the Romans sacked Jerusalem th there are Roman depictions of the Ark of the Covenant being pillaged but it wouldn't have been the original ark it would have been some kind of replica ark that was used uh, so what was the Ark of the Covenant originally well of course it's described in, in multiple places in the Torah uh, and it was essentially a box right that, that was sacred on the top of it were the, the carved angels, uh, and that was the throne for the Lord to sit. So, so the Lord was present among the Israelites, uh, sitting invisibly on the throne on the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark, of course, contained the Ten Commandments and other symbols of, of the Exodus, the manna, and the staff of Moses. Uh, and if, at other times, you know, other things were put with the Ark, like the sin offerings of the Philistines who stole it and stuff like that. Um, but the Ark of the Covenant, um, according to one legend, according to one Christian legend, the Ark of the Covenant today is in a Christian monastery in Ethiopia. 
Ethiopia and in a monophysite monastery. And uh, it, we can't go and verify it because no one's allowed to go look at the thing. It's in this monophysite monastery and, and they have a, one monk who's tasked with taking care of it. And, uh, and when he dies, a replacement is named. And so there's only ever one guy who's allowed to see the Ark of the Covenant. So that they have it there. They have it in this Christian monastery. They claim that it's the original Ark, Ark with a capital A. Uh, but it's there. It's not allowed out. No one's allowed to see it. And I frankly wouldn't want to see it because of what happens half the time that people look at the Ark of the Covenant. So, you know, there we go. And, uh, you know, and of course, Raiders of the Lost Ark, obviously. Anyway, so, uh, so there we are. That's the Ark of the Covenant. We Next question. To, we wouldn't want to see you start melting. That yeah, be yeah good. No, 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 no. Okay, other questions? Yes. I think it's in Deuteronomy that uh, the Lord speaks through Moses uh, and uh, tells the Israelites, well, you didn't actually do much to all these folks. I sent the hornet before you. So who was the hornet? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, no, I'm... I'm I, I'm not going to, I could go digging through the path, through my Bible looking for that passage, but I, I wouldn't find it. It would waste all of your time. No, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if Father Joseph or, uh, or Father Charles knows, but, uh, but off the top of my head, I don't. So. Uh, Yes. Uh, who are the Aramaeans, and why is Jesus speaking Aramaic? Good question, good question. Okay, so as far as, um, I, I guess we'll deal with the language uh, thing first. Uh, as far as language is concerned, okay, um, if you go all the way back to, say, 2400 B.C., uh, with the creation of the Akkadian Empire. Um, Akkadian, which is a Semitic language, it begins to supplant Sumerian as the spoken language in Mesopotamia and, and much of the Fertile Crescent. But uh, Akkadian and Sumerian kind of, they exist in, in a sort of a, um, Oh, what's the word for it in linguistics? A, a sprachbund, uh, I think is the word in, in linguistics, where, where you have two languages that influence one another greatly. So Sumerian was the literary language, a language of learning, a sacred language, uh, and the Sumerian alphabet was, was the prestige alphabet. The Akkadian language was the spoken language, the lingua franca of, of the region, you know, going back to 2400 BC, let's say. Um, but the two languages interpenetrated one another. They traded loan words and grammatical constructs and that sort of thing. Um, Akkadian becomes very archaic uh, as a spoken language, and, and it sort of fades. Uh, and it's in the time of the Neo-Assyrian Empire that some version of Aramaic apparently becomes the common spoken language of, of this portion of the Fertile Crescent up here in Mesopotamia and uh, down through here. So, so Aramaic becomes you know, sort of the, the most widely spoken lingua franca there. Of course, the, the Hebrews apparently had their own language that was distinct from Aramaic. It was, it's the language that we know as Biblical Hebrew. Although, it, it, Biblical Hebrew is so poorly attested, it's actually frustrating. We don't have a literary history of the Hebrew language, aside from the scriptural texts themselves, really. Uh, so, I mean, which we can understand well, and, and, and you know, there's, there's enough of a, a big sample of it there that you can create grammars and, and learn the language and read it. Um, but it, it's hard to tell how exactly Biblical Hebrew existed in relation to the spoken language of the ancient Israelites. It's hard to say. Uh, by the time of our Lord, a lot had happened in that region. Okay, the Israelites had been carried off to Babylon, uh, and they had come back from Babylon, and then successive waves of, of other conquerors had come, including Alexander the Great. Uh, and so what you have is, is a situation there in our Lord's time where the 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 language of the majority of residents of that part of the Levant, it was Aramaic. Now, why is that the case? Is that because of the Babylonian captivity? Uh, who knows, right? But, but, but Aramaic, it, it's a sort of a, it, it's closely related, I guess we can say, to biblical Hebrew. It's closely related enough to, ch to trade loan words with it. And it's clear that by the time of our Lord, biblical Hebrew was already sort of ossified as, I, I shouldn't call it a dead language, but as a literary language. So biblical Hebrew was, was very much more a literary and a liturgical language, and Aramaic was more the, the spoken language, which was closely related enough to it to be a, a descendant of it. I say the analogy, it could be similar to, to the Middle East today, where the, the classical Arabic of the Quran 
is preserved um, by, by Muslims, of course, because, because you have to use it for ritual, for prayer, for, for reading the, the Quran, right? But nobody speaks that way. You know, no, nobody speaks in the way that the Quran is, is written. It, it would be like us going around speaking Shakespeare to each other or, or even Chaucer or something like that. It, it, it's just not how people speak, right? So you, so you have Arabic dialects that are, in, they, in some sense, they have a relationship to the older literary language, but they're different, they're distinct. That's, that's probably the way that um, Jewish Aramaic was in relation to Hebrew. Related Semitic language, but also very, very distinct. And the, the one being an older ossified literary language, the other being an evolving spoken lingua franca. Now, when people say Arameans, uh, it's, uh, it, it's one of these really generic ethnographic terms. To talk about Arameans, um, it, it's, uh, these ethnographic terms like, like Arameans and Akkadians and Babylonians and even Hittites and things like that, these are ethnographic terms that, that are really kind of dicey and, and it's hard to define precisely what they mean, right? Because like, when we talk about Hittites or Babylonians or Assyrians, usually the, those terms make sense if you're talking about politics, if you're talking about empires and, and political entities that, that are created. It makes less sense to use those terms as though we're talking about ethnic groups. Right? Aramaic, Arameans, it, it's one of these catch-all um, ethnographic terms, like Scythians or Hurrians or something like that, uh, is what I would say. So. In the course of your talk, Dr. McGuire, um, you had mentioned that Samuel had warned the Jews against uh, desiring a king, and mm -hmm. God had said the same thing. Um, how do we reconcile this refusal for a king there um, with God's ultimate fulfillment of his promise in the person of Jesus Christ, the king? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's a fantastic thing. It's a fantastic question because... The, the story of salvation history in the Old Testament, it's constantly a story of uh, God setting out plan A and then God having to come up with plan B because of what the Israelites do. Uh, you know, so, so God gives them plan A, they do something else, and then it's like, all right, here's plan B. You know, so, hey, Saul, you would have had an eternal throne. God said it, you would have had an eternal throne, except you committed the sacrilege. And so then plan B comes about, David comes in. Right? And you know, so I, I think God, is he's constantly adjusting his plans in response to events on the ground, I guess you could say. And so the, obviously the redeemer of mankind in the person of our Lord uh, it was planned from all the way back in, in the third chapter of Genesis, right? The, the redeemer was promised. But the fact that, that he comes as a son of David and effectively as, as an Israelite king, uh, to claim, you know, the, the, the throne of David, right, but not in the sense that, that his contemporaries imagined him claiming it, right, but he, he's clearly identified as the son of David and as an Israelite king. Uh, that, that's, I think, an example of the way in which God will situate himself in events, and he always works through and with particular events. So, you know, the, the same way, like, you know, uh, oh, I, I don't know, in all, in all kinds of ways we see God's providence working this way. Uh, but anyway, I'll just, yeah. Yeah. Yes, in all the years of various aspects of scripture study, I've just never heard it so well um, said oh. that the whole thing is about liturgy and worship. Mm -hmm. And I thank you. Uh, so two questions, well, one, one is why, why has that been not emphasized by everybody, by everybody, mm -hmm. and aren't we in deep trouble? <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, this is what people were, were just asking during the break. Yeah, as, as far as liturgy and worship are concerned, um, yeah, we're, we're in deep trouble as people in a variety of ways if we, if we don't avail ourselves of the opportunity to receive the sacraments, uh, if we don't see our relationship with God as being mediated through the priesthood and, and the sacraments. Then, then we're in deep trouble. Uh, and uh, I, I think as, as lay people, there, we have to distinguish what's helpful and what's not helpful for our own spiritual lives. And uh, I, you know, I, I'll be the first one to rail against liturgical abuse. As angry lay people to rail against liturgical abuses, that doesn't necessarily help us either, right? Uh, but to, to look at our own souls, to, to avail ourselves of the sacraments, to confess our sins and to receive the Eucharist worthily, you know, then, then we're being the good Israelite, I think, at, at that point. Uh, now, as far as the general issue of liturgical abuses in the church and all of that, I think the, uh, the church has had a, a, this perennial task of dealing with the sinfulness of men and, and ensuring proper liturgy and proper, proper worship. And uh, we have to be willing to kind of do our part to make that 
happen, right? Um, but yeah, liturgy and worship, they, they are absolutely key, just as much for us as, as for the Israelites. So. Thank you very much, Dr. McGuire. Oh, thanks, man.